besides, we're willing to be beaten for democracy. And you misuse democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. Only white males with property were allowed to vote. And slaves was recognized as three-fifth persons. And for the first time, the community was confronted with Negroes in places where they had never been. So we sat right down with a boycott, right up at the corner. The thousand Negroes and 400 white ministers and civil rights workers reached the end of the bridge where the cordon of troopers stand. I saw a sea of blue, blue helmets, blue state trooper uniform, blue state trooper cars parked parallel on each side of the highway. Saturday, June 10th. It's just shy of 6 a.m. and we're on the road. Western Pennsylvania is really green this time of year and the soft light of morning makes everything look even greener. I don't know. This is the first day of the Returning to the Roots of Civil Rights bus tour and there's a lot of driving in front of us. And that's everybody. Welcome to uh, the fifth annual uh, Returning to the Roots of Civil Rights bus tour. Well, we're gonna have a lot of excitement ahead over the next eight days. By the late 1950s, other dissenting voices were finding a national audience. My name is Todd Allen, and I am the uh, director of the Common Ground Project. Uh, the Common Ground Project in partnership with PNC Financial Services. This is the fifth anniversary uh, for the bus tour. Uh, and it's an opportunity to give participants a chance to, uh, as I like to say, engage living history, uh, particularly as it relates to the civil rights movement. And so we take uh, participants throughout the South on an eight-day journey, which they get a chance to visit not only a lot of the key sites of the movement, but a lot of the veterans of the movement as well. I came on this trip because I was born in the North. I was born during the time that all the marches was going on. For the last five years, uh, we've had a cross-section of participants. Every so often, I just need to recommit, you know, because I, I believe that all this work that we're doing is just a continuation of the work that was started. I believe this year it ranges in age from 16 up into the mid-70s and kind of everything in between. Black history, African American studies is my passion, and I feel that it's important for our children to know their history and their heritage. People come from a variety of walks of life. Uh, we have students, high school, college, uh, graduates. Uh, we have a number of educators, we have a number of, of professional persons. Uh, it's just really is a, a diverse mix. I grew up in the South. I grew up just outside of Atlanta. And I grew up in an you know, upper middle class, white, suburban, subdivision neighborhood. And I saw the KKK march. And you know, I saw these good old boys flying the rebel flags. And, and I said, well, that's not me, so I'm not racist. And there's a lot of things that I don't know about the civil rights that I'd like to see. And I, it's just a good educational opportunity. This is the fourth time that I've been on this trip. And I, it began as um, an ongoing interest in civil rights and social justice. When we get to Greensboro, we're going to make two stops. Uh, our first stop will be at the Woolworths uh, store. And then from there, we'll go over to the campus of North Carolina A&T. Yeah, why don't you guys go out to take a quick photo. Why don't we do it right here? Move in a little bit. Move in. Move in. Say cheese. Saturday, June 10th. We visited Greensboro, North Carolina. This is where four young black men from a t who were tired of racial segregation decided they were not going to take it anymore. But I'm sorry, our management does not allow us to serve niggers in here. They took seats at Woolworth's segregated counters where blacks were not allowed. This led to an explosion of sit-ins there and in other cities. I want to be among these four. Within a period of two months, the movement had spread to 65 cities involving every southern state, with the exception of Mississippi. I went here. I lived here. At 13, I got arrested. I'm visiting my mother in Greensboro. I live in New Jersey. Because I was 13, they could not literally arrest me, but I have an affidavit that came from the juvenile courts that I treasure. All right. I'll on your camera if you run out. Like, wow, you know, just like four young boys willing to stand for a cause and spark a movement. I was in grade school. I can remember it. Come home every day watching it on television. Just as I have a dream. I watched on a black and white TV. 
you never forget it. You never forget it. One day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Martin Luther King didn't see a burning bush, but he did hear a voice telling him, Martin, go down in the south and tell the leaders to free the people and let my people go. Day two, Sunday, June 11th. Martin Luther King, Jr. What would the civil rights movement be without him? Hearing his words and seeing him struggle moves and inspires me. You can only get so much out of textbooks, and what I've got today out of this whole, this whole museum is more than what I've ever got throughout grade school, middle school, high school, because it's really been locked away from today's youth, and we need we need to know this. This is important to know, you know what I mean? For some, it's an opportunity to really be introduced to this history for the first time. Please help me welcome Dr. Glenn Eskew. Some people, I, I know it's hard to believe in this day and age, but you say the Little Rock Nine, they have no idea who you're talking about. What I want to talk about is uh, the idea of a civil rights tour and the place of Birmingham within it. Or well, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, they don't know who he is. Uh, and Reverend Shuttlesworth and other veterans who participated in the demonstrations there in Birmingham dating back to 1956, indeed going back even further. We're sloughing off the old white supremacy, racist society and culture and demanding their rights as citizens. You couldn't vote in most instances. You couldn't go to school. Uh, you know, there were all sorts of restrictions. And not to mention the fact that if you spoke up or stood up or challenged this unjust system, you would probably disappear. You know, when they start talking about the movement, they start talking about the men, but they never give the women credit. It was the women that played, I think, an incredibly central role. Women filled those churches. Had it not been for the women, I don't know what would have happened to that Montgomery bus boycott. You could not have had the success, for example, that you had in Montgomery without the women. They only give one woman credit, that's Rosa Parks. Rosa may have been the woman who got tired. The people were exhausted. They were just worn out. The entire city of Montgomery was worn out with the abuse from bus drivers because they had police powers almost. That's why the buses rolled empty after Rosa didn't give up her seat. You know, I grew up learning about them and I was really under the impression that everybody knows this history. Well, everyone doesn't know this history. We've got to keep telling the story. And if we don't keep telling the story, young people will not know because many of our young people today, their parents don't even know. So they cannot tell them. And those of us who are alive and still kicking <laughs> should keep on you know, informing the children and, the, and, and their parents and their parents' parents that it was a great sacrifice and it isn't over. We're going today to Selma right now and keep in mind that there were people who offered themselves as sacrifices. Some of them actually died for the sole purpose of opening up the right to vote for all people. And this is sacred ground that you'll be walking on today. Sacred ground. That's exactly how I felt at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. History happened here. Beatings happened here. An attack on the American way of life. I don't feel worthy to walk over this bridge. I'm just walking to get to the other side. They walked for the right to vote. The first time when I came into Selma, when I rode across the bridge, I got chills. It, it was just unbelievable crossing that bridge that so many people were beaten on. The very first time that I walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that was the most emotional moment for me. From Selma's 14,000 Negroes, only a few more than 300 had been registered at the polls. Selma sprang overnight from an obscure southern town to the front pages of world newspapers. 
This church was headquarters in the Negro Drive for the right to vote. This morning, I'm not going to take much time at all to introduce Dr. Frederick Reese who was the president of the Dallas County Voters League at the time when things were going on. I'm just going to stop right there because I'm going to let him tell his own story. Dr. Reese. On January the 2nd, 1965, in this church, Brown Chapel Church, we called that meeting. At 3 o'clock that day, this church was packed. There were those in the balcony standing on the outside of this church ready to go to jail if necessary because no longer we want to let that injunction keep us from meeting and strategizing for progress, particularly for the right to vote. In 1965 in Selma, Alabama, a group of black citizens received less than full cooperation in their effort to register as voters. It was decided that we then would engage in a march from Selma to Montgomery on March the 7th, 1965. Let me tell you what I saw on that day. I saw a sea of blue, blue helmets, blue state trooper uniform, blue state trooper cars parked parallel on each side of the highway. And the leader of that uh, state uh, trooper group gave orders for the state troopers to move in on the marches. And they moved in with their bitter clubs crutched on both ends. You've seen this picture, I guess. And literally went down the line of marches toppling the marches over, as if you would top a bowling pins in a bowling alley. They then withdrew into the billy clubs and began to beat heads. I saw blood flowing. Pandemonium broke out in the crowd. It was a state of disbelief that this was happening in these United States of America. Now, when Dr. King came to Selma, things really heated up. Really heated up. We said, instead of marching once a week, we started marching every day, all day long. We started going to jail. I went to jail 13 times by the time I was 11. Oh. It was almost always swollen. <laughs> <laughs> one by one, as these arrests mounted, people began to look upon that as a badge of real honor. And at the mass meetings, people who had been arrested were praised and, and uh, just worshipped as heroes and sheroes. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. Today I really began to understand that these people we see as heroes of a movement that changed history were ordinary people who really just stood up where they were, when they were needed, and when God called them. Well, let me welcome you to the National Voting Rights Museum and Institute. One of our primary goals for this museum was to identify and document people we call the foot soldiers of the voting rights struggle. It makes me proud of them that they were willing to fight and, and some of them die so that I could have the right to vote. I've been seeing how people gave their lives for that right and uh, people don't appreciate it uh, and they don't use it. So collectively we, we have no voice. Do so I have to hold it down or something? Can you see the words? All right. You heard a beeping? Yeah. That was it. That was In 1985, a young black man uh, named Michael Donald was actually lynched in Mobile, Alabama uh, by Ku Klux Klan. Tuesday, June 13th, after visiting the Southern Poverty Law Center. It was 1955 in the Mississippi Delta. Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy, had said something to a white man. Emmett Till's mother wanted an open casket at her son's funeral so that people could see the reality of what had happened. The reality of the fruit of racism, hatred, and fear. And as I looked at the wall of the 40 martyrs of the civil rights movement, that reality was screaming out. People were coming here from all over the world, really making a mecca to the beginnings, uh, to the place where the civil rights movement began. And as I moved all around the South, I discovered that at least half of the spots that were famous were not even marked. I think it's important for people to go and visit civil rights sites in the same way that they go to memorials in Washington, D.C. These were even though they were modest sites, maybe times a cafe or a street corner, a bus stop, 
these were as momentous as places in Congress or the Supreme Court. And I think people need to go there, first of all, to learn the history. Uh, secondly, I think, to uh, fully appreciate the atmosphere in which uh, these, uh, the, the heroism occurred. The emotion that you feel when you actually uh, go to some of these places, and especially when you meet the people that made this history. Uh, there's a great feeling of pride in knowing that it was successful. Uh, there's a lot of deep sadness knowing that many people didn't make it through, and some of those that did uh, have been scarred. People really won't understand American history uh, to their, I think, heart and soul until they go and visit these spots. I read about it in the papers, and it is, I'm actually reliving it. And a lot of emotions are coming up, um, different feelings. And I think every young person should take this tour. Everybody should see this. It's unbelievable. We learn about the civil rights movement in school, and like it's nothing compared to what we're seeing here. Like actually being here and being able to feel what the people have felt listening to their stories. When the lights went out and everything went black, the clock stopped. Here is where four little girls died. And that happened Sunday, September 15, 1963. The four girls were in an area that is now our kitchen at the time of the bombing. They were in the direct vicinity of that glass. Denise, if she was living today, would be 54 years old. The church bombing was uh, on September the 15th, 1963. Had she lived till November the 17th, she would have been 12 years old. She was our only child at the time. You know, it was 14 years after the church bombing before anybody was tried. This is the inevitable result of hatred, of racism, of fear. The murders of children, of white sympathizers, of those fighting for basic human rights. And that is what this trip has been about as a whole, too. It has forced me to see history that I don't want to see. One of the events that has stayed with me is the fact that it was the children's movement that broke the back of segregation in Birmingham, Alabama in May of 1963. Sometimes we think it was a movement of just these older adults. Uh, and even though the, the adults weren't as old as we sometimes think, but children were involved as well. This is the reason Birmingham was such a successful campaign is because the children were involved. Members of SCLC who had been working with youth hit on the idea, this is their struggle too. And I'll just simply make it plain by saying that were it not for the children, we would not have won the civil rights. Dr. King didn't support the idea. Indeed, Malcolm X ridiculed it, letting children do what men should be doing. And those youth who had been attending these mass meetings and singing marched out the doors of 16th Street Baptist Church that May day in 1963 and changed the history of the country and indeed of the world. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country.
Thursday, June 16th. They were just kids. Kids who desired an education. Yet the members of the Little Rock Nine were also revolutionaries. They willingly sacrificed their extracurricular activities, friendships, and quietude in exchange for jeers, threats, violence, and social isolation. Why? So the city of Little Rock schools would be integrated. It's just a little haunting, I think, to be on the same grounds where you see pictures of, you know, these nine students who pretty much were tormented, spit upon, and really just, in some ways, sacrificed themselves to make, you know, progress in our country. And you can only guess what it must have felt like to march up those steps each day to a soundtrack of epitaphs alone save for an armed soldier assigned as a guard. I think it would have taken an um, effect like on my personal life and experience with other races. I don't think I would have not went just because I would have been standing up for everybody else who didn't get the opportunity to go, but I think it would have been difficult. I don't think I would have stopped attending the school just to show how strong I was myself. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. Now, as you all were coming up the courtyard area, you may have noticed that this was once the Lorraine Motel. It is the site that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4th of 1968. Standing outside on the balcony, outside room 306, where the wreath is standing, is the actual spot where Dr. King was standing. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, me Day seven, the Lorraine Hotel. I've been moved by the many places we've been but it would seem that the places of Martin Luther King's birth and death are the places that move me to the page. No. no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. We as a people are still not free. No longer are we bound by the physical chains or legal inequality. The ties that bind us now are more insidious one has to but look in the mirror to see his jailer, for it is the landscape of the mind that is in desperate need of emancipation. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! We are free at last! A generation today could never like, do what they did, because I don't think we'd step up like how they did and like accomplish what they accomplished. If you look in today's society, there's a lot of black-on-black -black violence. Yeah. And you know what? Dr. King Although he did and plan to do a lot of great things, I, in this generation, I don't see much of it being followed. We've come far, but we have a long, long way to go, especially today when I see us killing each other, and that hurts. That hurts. I got on the bus hoping to look like I was just a white woman riding a bus. Salim McCullough, a young white college student, heard about this thing called the Freedom Rides. The intention was to travel across the country as an interracial group and desegregate everything. Desegregate the waiting rooms and the buses themselves. It was a sunny day when we passed over the Tennessee line. We began to see people, line, men, lining the roads with shotguns. As we got into the Birmingham bus station, there were crowds and crowds of people, as well as a number of policemen. They called one of the fellows to the front of the bus, didn't like what he had to say, and they began to beat him. So I decided to play the role of this southern white lady and I began to scream, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, no, I can't stand that. Oh, please don't. And they got all flustered. So they just dropped Bill on the floor and they said, oh, lady, we're not hurting anybody. Her story is just a, an excellent testimony of one who's willing to, to give up the safety and security of home 
um, because you see an injustice and you want to go out and make things right. We aren't, weren't any different than you are. None of us were totally brave or totally anything. We were just kids that believed something very strongly. We believed in the dignity of every human being. In my way. Everything is so emotional and some things are depressing and like we dropped the ball now, it's time to pick it up and you know, carry on. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. And you all continue what we started. In spite of over 50 years of that struggle, we have not completely overcome, but we have come a long way. But believe me when I tell you, we still have a long way to go. Mrs. Lauza of Grand Rapids, Michigan, a housewife and a mother of five. That's her right there. Okay. Okay? Thank you. I know, I had never heard her story before. And you're from Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring that back. Please, make people know her. She gave, you know, her life. There is still in the hearts of people this reservoir of racism and classism and sexism and genderism and all you know all of these things that were we used that we used to put down other people so that's what we're fighting today uh, get her if you miss me <laughs> <laughs> there are people who died sweated blood tears and laid a foundation that we're able to grow upon and you owe those people to take advantage of the opportunities that you have you also owe the future generations to lay something new to build upon build upon foundations and not break them down and I thank you thank you for that very inspirational talk thank you thank you i really enjoyed this and i want you to be successful thank okay you. i want people to come away with a sense that this is our history this is an african american history this is American history, and in a, lot, in a big sense, it's world history. I know who I do, huh?